Good evening, uh, colleagues and audience members. Uh, my name is Ed Rice Singer, and I am the chairman of the Land Use and Transportation Committee for the Baltimore City Council. We are here this evening to conduct the first of uh, seven public hearings in the community on City Council Bill 12-0152, Transform Baltimore Zoning. This comprehensive zoning code rewrite is a very important time to learn about the general's public land use and zoning priorities. We want to hear from as many of our constituents as possible. Every hearing is open to the public testimony and citizens may come and provide testimony at each public hearing. The following guidelines, however, will be enforced today and throughout this process. Person, persons wishing to offer oral testimony must sign in and state their name, their address, or community in which they reside and who, if anyone, they represent uh, for the record. Individual, individuals offering testimony will be limited to a single three-minute testimony. The sign-in sheets are in the back. This is what they look like. Um, if multiple persons from any organization or affiliated group or present, one representative should be designated to speak on behalf of that organization or group. Individuals may not sign in to testify and then yield their time to another uh, pre presenter. As stated previously, all individuals will be permitted to testify only once. If the individual has points they wish to raise that cannot be addressed in the allotted three-minute time period, they can submit written testimony to committee staff at the hearing. If you would like to attend a hearing to testify about part of a zoning code ordinance other than the sections the committee intends to study during this hearing, you may do so and your testimony will be taken during the hearing. If you wish to provide written testimony, please mail, mail it to the Office of Council Services Attention to Antoine Banks, who is sitting to my right, located at 100 North Holiday Street, Baltimore, Maryland, 21202, or you can send an email at antoine.banks at baltimorecity.gov. Uh, grand rules tonight, the first one is, could you please uh, turn off your iPhone, cell phones, uh, to give respect and courtesy to those who are gonna uh, give testimony. Uh, planning will provide us with the report, which includes a PowerPoint presentation. And what I ask is no questions made during the presentations. After the presentations, we'll ask questions. Um, uh, regards to the council members in attendance, can ask two questions. After each member has, has asked their questions, council members may ask a follow-up question. Uh, Immediately following the planning uh, department, we will go to the other agencies to give their report and updates. And what, what we decided to do, uh, the committee, I and the committee, is that after the agencies give their reports, uh, the council will sit back and not ask any questions. We're gonna have the audience come up and testify first and ask the questions, and I and my colleagues will Will follow after that. Um, we only have the, the, the school to I think it's nine o'clock, so um, it's not like being at City Hall where we're, we can stay longer than that. Um, I also like to introduce, um, uh, we have with this um, to my right, my colleagues, uh, the President of City Council, President Jack Bernard Jack Young. To his left is Councilwoman Ricky Spector. Thanks, Mr. Chair. To my left is Councilman Jim Craft, who is the Vice Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. To his immediate left is Councilwoman Mary Pat Clark. To her left is Councilwoman Sharon Green Middleton. And to uh, Councilwoman Middleton's left is Councilman Carl Stokes. Uh, we also, uh, my st staff people here is, um, Antoine Banks and uh, Larry Green. We're also joined by uh, Angela Gibson, who's representing Mayor Stephanie Rawlings Blake, who's in the audience. Also, we have Michelle Worsberger representing the President Jack Young. 
And to her right, we also have an intern, uh, Mr. Aaron Rowe, and uh, from the president's office, uh, who is working uh, very diligent and a lot of time and energy on this, is Kara Kunst, who is in the audience. And I want to give a special thanks to the principal of the school, Ms. Kyles. Could you please stand up? I mean, I want to thank you for hosting us today. Thank you. And at this time, we will go with the painting department. I don't think it's on. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the council. Um, just for the audience's benefit, I also wanted to note that there's planning department staff in the lobby with maps available if citizens have questions about any of the uh, individual properties and that sort of thing. So, um, first slide, please. Okay. I'm going to do a brief presentation on primarily the chapters advertised for today, one, two, three, and six. Uh, but just starting off with an introduction, what is zoning? Of course, it is the rules and regulations that govern what you can do with a piece of land in terms of use and structure. Uh, zoning dates back to 1923 in Baltimore, and our recent code was written in 1971. The purpose of zoning is to protect the health, safety, and welfare of our citizens and to provide some predictability within zones and following a same set of rules. It is important to recognize that zoning code is a law passed by local governments. It defines districts. It includes both maps and texts and contains rules of, for the types of structures. The zoning regulations are the first step in determining what is allowed to be built on a piece of property. Also important to note, zoning does not distinguish between good businesses and bad businesses, nor is it a determinant of human behavior. And why are we doing a new zoning code at this time? As I mentioned, our current code was written in 1971 and that's the last time it was comprehensively reviewed. We know we're in a different place in Baltimore, a different place in the world. It was very auto-oriented at that time, and we had still a very heavy manufacturing base. Uh, we believe that the new code is to move Baltimore towards the future and for a growing economy and recognizing some of the new economy. Uh, this is a result of the comprehensive plan passed in 2006 and again the goal is to predict and guide development, enhance neighborhood character, strengthen retail, and promote job growth. These uh, eight principles are what we used in drafting the code uh, and I won't read through them all. I think you have them in front of you and the audience can see but we intended to modernize the code, the use structure, and follow the comprehensive master plan including uh, promoting sustainable development. And the sustainability plan, of course, is part of our comprehensive plan. Uh, briefly, a summary of the code. Uh, I mentioned the titles for tonight as advertised. But just to give you the table of contents for the zoning code, uh, it is titles 1 through 19. And um, we're doing 1, 2, 3 definitions purpose, code administration, and six tonight. Uh, Title I, the definitions. This is the section that covers the rules of interpretation. It includes how time is calculated, uh, what is the, a table in the code versus a figure. A table is code and legislated. A figure is illustrative. Um, it, it also explains generic uses which is the new approach to land use to simplify and group them under larger categories. And it also includes a section of citywide prohibited uses. And the second part of Title I is simply a definition of all terms. Uh, a minute on generic uses. 
These are specific uses grouped into larger categories. So in our current code, for example, we do things like shoe stores and hat stores and clothing stores. And in the new code, we have retail goods. They are grouped by similar impact. And then in every category, in every table, it says whether those uses are permitted, conditional, or not permitted. And each group of uses is defined and clearly stated what is permitted in there and not. Uh, and if it's not listed as a generic use, if it's included in a generic use, it can't be used in a standalone use. Next slide. Title II, the purpose and intent. Um, most of this comes to us, the purpose of zoning, comes to us from the state land use articles, that is the authority for the city council to develop zoning for Baltimore City. It was formerly known as Article 66B, now it's the state land use articles. And in addition to that, um, we have supplemented the purpose for Baltimore City to talk about the sustainability, the comprehensive master plan, preserving and promoting employment and um, employment centers. So in addition to the base, protect the health, safety, and welfare. Next. Title II also includes the transition rules or the rules that would be followed when you go from the old code to the new code um, in terms of if it's existing or if it's a permitted use that becomes conditional and how that is outlined um, or if it's a, um, a not permitted use that becomes permitted. Uh, also note in the code in Title II, we say that this code would only become effective six months after it's signed into law. And of course, the reason for that is to clean out the building permit system to not harm somebody who's started a project under one code so they don't get tangled up in that. Next. Title III is the code administration. This is kind of the who does what. Um, and what each job is related to the zoning code. The zoning administrator, of course, is the sort of keeper of the entire code, and um, that is uh, the position that's defined. They must interpret, verify, uh, determine major and minor variances, and keep the records. The Board of Municipal and Zoning Ma Appeals can grant variances, conditional uses, and certify maps. Planning Commission makes recommendations on various items. They are not the decision maker except for development review um, and design review. Director of Planning uh, does development review and design review and then the Housing Commissioner issues the permits and of course only the City Council can approve, amend, zoning, maps, text, plan unit developments. Uh, this is just a table for the user's ease to follow how this works. So whether there is a, um, an agency that must comment on a variance and then who can actually grant it. Next. And Title VI is very straightforward. Um, it basically outlines the districts and how the maps would work. Um, this is the content that Title VII is open space and environmental districts. Eight is the detached, semi-detached residential. Row house and multifamily is nine, commercial 10, industrial, etc. 12 is the special purpose. And I just want to briefly go through how the maps are read, so we'll just, um, because that relates to Title VI. So the section on mapping. Essentially, there were four principles to developing the maps. Uh, the first one, maintain the current districts at their present location where the controls are appropriate for that pattern that's there and there's no change desired. Uh, we try to re remap areas to reduce nonconformities. Um, that, so if an existing property was nonconforming, to correct that in the mapping. And to remap to uh, applicable, implement policies such as master plans or goals such as transit-oriented development and specific conditions. And I'll just show a couple examples. Next. This is the map grid for reading that's been on our website for the citizens to read. And uh, just to show example, if the existing conditions are there, 
and you want to map it to the district that matches what's on the ground. Uh, this slide is an example of a change in area uh, because in an R4, for example, semi-detached houses are permitted, uh, R3 is detached houses, and where the area in question was R4, but all the houses were detached, we made the recommendation that that should be R3 to match the category that's built on the ground. Next. Uh, where we have change in policies, we did mapping changes for that. This is an example of the reuse of a loft building, and we have a new category, industrial mixed use, that is ideal for that reuse. And uh, transit-oriented development is a new category, and that was, again, to encourage transit usage, so we created a category and mapped accordingly. Um, it may be noted that the transit-oriented development mapping is within the, the walking distance of the transit station, and it's only on the properties where redevelopment is expected to occur, not on existing homes that are, that are there, uh, but more on the vacant property. And uh, these are just examples of the campus and hospital zoning as they are applied, and I think that may be it. And some of the new tools, the row house mixed use overlay, as well as the uh, detached house overlay zones. Thank you. Lori, well, thank you for your presentation. I uh, did a great job. Um, next agency, the law department. Do you have anything to add to your from last report, except for the amendments that you introduced? Okay, you'll have to go through the amendments just to get a report. Uh, I'm Vic Turvola from the Law Department. Good evening. Uh, we worked very closely over the summer with the uh, Planning Department to uh, amend the, or to try to amend the, uh, the uh, proposed bill. Uh, essentially, we, most of the changes that we recommended were very small. There's a couple of large ones. In Article 5, that deals with conditional uses. We wanted to make sure it was explicit that uh, the City Council could introduce a bill and begin the process because the, the process that's outlined in Article 5 uh, really, as we read it, began with uh, issues that, that related to the Planning Commission. We wanted to make sure that the City Council could issue that bill uh, at any time and then they would jump into the process that's laid out in Article 5, so it was just a language change. And once again, I think the Planning Commission always believed that, that you all had the authority to do that. We were just making it explicit. The same thing we did in Article okay. 13 for the plan unit development. We made sure that uh, our language would make express that you could uh, jump in and introduce a bill at any time and then jump into the process. Thank you. Um, and that's pretty much the size right. of what our changes were. Okay, thank you. DPW has a report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Marsha Collins, representing the Department of Public Works. Uh, we reviewed um, the uh, zoning code proposals, and we really only had a couple of recommendations, uh, what we, which we have also discussed with the Department of Planning. Uh, and I believe that um, there were all of our issues were addressed recently um, at the Planning Commission. It had to do with the definition of yards and the prohibition of having structures in yard areas, designated yard areas, and we just wanted clarification that stormwater management facilities, which are basically depressions in the ground and which may have slight berms around them and pipes for extraneous drainage, would not be considered a structure. And the Planning Commission at their most recent meeting uh, agreed with that concern because we did not want to be promoting stormwater management and stormwater opportunities and then find that they were prohibited by putting them in yards, which is exactly where we need them. So we just wanted that for clarification. And we appreciate the fact that the Planning Commission considered that seriously. Um, we had a typo that we identified and that was taken care of. And um, we also had an issue whereby the Department of Public Works was supposed to be notified uh, three weeks prior to the operation, beginning yeah, to produce yeah, radioactive or hazardous materials. We felt that was more of a state or health department function. Uh, 
Um, my understanding is they also favorably considered that as well. So at this time, we have nothing further to add, Mr. Chairman. Okay. We'll come back. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Is there any other agency that needs to give a report? Is that on our sheet? Okay, thank you. We are now joined uh, by uh, Councilman Warren Branch. Thanks, Councilman. Uh, he sits, he's, he uh, sits on the committee. And now we're going to go to the audience. And again, anyone who wishes to testify, the, the sheets are back in the back. Um, for signing, and we are going to start with uh, Joan Floyd, and then after Joan Floyd is uh, Douglas Armstrong. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Is, this is that is that on? I'm not sure. oh, on. Yeah. Um, uh, my address is 2828 North Howard Street. I'm also uh, the current president of the Remington Neighborhood Alliance. Um, a couple words about districts tonight. Uh, many of the district names in Title VI are misleading, and the corresponding descriptions in Title X through 12 of the mixed-use districts are also misleading. These districts are really all about the proposed residential density. Uh, I urge you to take a close look at the uh, new mixed-use districts with respect to the, the current mixed-use districts. Among our existing mixed-use districts, we have um, one that requires 2,500 square foot of lot area and three that require 5,000 square feet of lot area. These uh, low densities are not being carried yeah, over. Mr. Chairman, uh, hold it. Right. What are you talking about? We can't. First of all, can you step back from the microphone just a bit? Yeah. Sure, I'd be happy so to. Yeah. I don't know if you're going to. Yeah. Do, do, you, do you have a copy of your report? No, I don't. Okay. I all right. If you can send it to us. Tonight. Yeah. So, and what's the, what, what are you referring to, mixed-use districts? I'm, I'm referring to districts from the subject of districts, and I'm, I'm asking you to take a look at the district Tiny. names and the district descriptions and the district Tiny. densities. And I'm pointing out a couple things that were never apparent to us in any previous discussions that took place yeah. in this whole process going back to 2005. Ms. Floyd, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, because we're here this, this evening on specifically titles one, two, three, and six, can you tell us to which you're referring so we can be clear? Because we're trying to identify all, the, right. all this. We have many, many hearings coming. It's well, we're going to use up all my time. We're not. Right. Okay. We're not counting your time right, right I now. I started with Title VI, okay. which is where they name the districts. Right. But then okay. you have to go to okay. Title X, where they tell you what the districts are, yeah. and then you, from there, you go to tables, which tell you what the densities of the districts right. are. But it starts with Title VI. Okay, which is where we start tonight. Um, the new mixed-use district with the lowest residential density, paradoxically, are, the, are two of the transit-oriented districts. Two of the TOD districts actually have the lowest proposed residential density. Um, and they propose 1,200 square feet of minimum lot area per unit. Um, that's roughly equivalent to some of the B districts we have today. Uh, but the majority of the new mixed-use districts are at least four times that density as proposed. Um, uh, four of the new mixed-use districts require only 300 square feet of lot area per unit. And that works out to, that's a brand new residential dens density for our city, and it works out to 145 units per acre. Um, the proposed OR2 is 200 square feet per acre. I I'm sorry, I'm just going to go ahead and give the testimony. Um, according to the protocols that were on the, on the wall, uh, 200 square feet is 218 units per acre. And there are four mixed use districts which have no minimum lot area, no density limit at all. Uh, so when they're speaking about new <coughs> mixed-use districts, they're really speaking about facilitating high-rise apartment buildings in places like our neighborhood, where we already have a lot of mixed-use just zoning, but we don't have very much high-density zoning right now at all. Um, if you can think of the infamous Crestmont building, that was built at 1,100 square feet per unit. Now think of four times that density 
and you can have an image of what they're actually proposing for the neighborhood. Um, we are a low-rise, low-row house neighborhood now. Under the proposed map, we will become a high-rise apartment uh, neighborhood. The single most important parcel that we have in our neighborhood is the northeast corner of 29th Street and Remington Avenue, 242 West 29th Street, 75,000 square feet of publicly owned land that have been designated by us for a future neighborhood school, future public school. This is the land that you all so graciously zoned P for public use for us at our request back in 2007. Needless to say, we do not want a 250-unit apartment building on this land. But that is what exactly would, could be the future under the proposed new map. 250 apartments where we want to put a school. Um, and the new code does not allow us to keep public use designation. There's no such thing in the proposal right now. So what do we do? We have we are asking you, it's a formal request tonight, we're asking you for EC1 zoning for that parcel, Educational Campus 1, which is primary and secondary, so that under that zoning, the existing police use could remain, no problem, but the land would be reserved for a future school site, which is so important to us. So, so this is our first official request of you from the Remington Neighborhood Alliance of this body to amend the map to make that land EC1. Okay, so can I? No. Yeah, 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 Mary Pat. EC1 for 242. Mary Pat. Oh. Got to do it. So you want EC1 for 242 West 20. And in the same land, there were actually two, there was another small parcel that that was also part of that. Yeah. So we would we would be coming to you with that specific, both of those specific parcels, um, and asking for them to be EC1, and that is a formal uh, voted on request that we're. Putting I got tonight. it. Thank I got it. I was part of the P effort. You all, most of you were part of the P. We all were. And uh, again, the, it's really important to understand okay. that that okay. land would accommodate under the proposal 250 apartments. I just okay. have a question. Yeah, sure, here. Yeah. With your request, that means the P would go away. Well, we don't want the P to go away, but unless the <coughs> council in its wisdom decides to create some kind of public use zoning, it will go away. It, it just didn't show up in the new code. I got it. Okay. There's no public facility zoning. There's no provision. Uh, we got a long I got it. Yeah. Time to work yeah. on all this, but, but that's a yeah. But so, Miss Floyd, if you could give us a copy, uh, you know, of, of your with, testimony. I'll provide you with one that doesn't look like the one that I have in front of me. Yeah. Okay. At a later date. I and and as I said, any amendments you have, send it to Antoine Banks' office. You have it. Okay. <laughs> Anyone else have any questions or? Thank you, Ms. Floyd. We are joined by uh, Councilman uh, Bill Henry, who sits on the committee to my right, uh, Mr. Uh, Douglas Armstrong. Good evening, uh, Douglas Armstrong, 2828 North Howard Street, uh, property owner. Um, unfortunately, I, I want to start my testimony by saying I'm doing so under protest. Um, as the City Council must have, and yet does not have at this time, independent legal counsel to help guide you through this effort and give you independent legal advice Jack, concerning you want to respond this, to that this particular you bill and its implications. You want to say um, I think this is a great mistake and you really need to rectify it before we continue because uh, some of these decisions could be very injurious to Baltimore homeowners and property owners. But at the same time, I, I will address the issue of definitions and the terms that there need to be better definitions in the code. And I'll start with just two. The definition of row houses. According to the definition, my house will stop being a row house if my neighbors decide to convert theirs to a non-residential use under the proposed new code. Who knows what may happen to my home then we because it won't fit problem. any residential definition that is a row house definition. In other words, if 
Neighbors decide to change the use of their home to something allowable that is not a residence. It could change the entire residential character of the rest of the block because you no longer fit a residential designation. This is pretty absurd and it needs to be corrected. The other is neighborhood commercial. This is another very poor definition and it has similar absurd consequences. It needs to be eliminated. We need to eliminate neighborhood commercial. The individual uses such as retail, restaurants, personal services establishments are separately defined, so keep it that way. If these uses are to be considered as potentially compatible in row houses, <coughs> districts, then let's have an honest and open and frank discussion of those as individual uses. What conditions would make a shop or a restaurant compatible with neighboring row houses? The size of the lot, the amount of parking, the hours of operation, whether there is a party wall, uh, the type of signage, the age and original use of the building, all of these issues, these things can be considered rationally after we get rid of neighborhood commercial designation. And I will try and give you a cleaned up copy as well and we'll continue to provide you with yeah, two, issues to be amended. And, yeah, okay. and, and also uh, any amendments that you have sent to And I just want to respond to your, your uh, first statement regards to the council having independent legal. Uh, the, president's, the president of the city council and this council, uh, this committee, has requested our own independent counsel. The work is in process to, to get that counsel. Um, so we are working on that. I, I strongly recommend it and find somebody from one of the outlying counties and a yeah. good paralegal to work that's, with. Them. That's what we did. To give you huh? some real honest. honest. Yeah. yeah. Um, we know. Can I ask him a question? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Councilman Council Clark. Just a, one, one question of fact. You're saying get rid of neighborhood commercial district. Are you meaning C1? Which one do you mean? Yes. Yeah, C1. Thank you. We'll give you. I can give you the whole rundown on your paper. Okay. Oh yeah. Thank you. I, I, I just want to. I hope. I hope you can get the council soon. Can I clarify? Independent. That? Yeah. Legal yeah. Council yeah. That would be very yeah. beneficial. Mr. Armstrong, are you saying abolish the C1 classification completely? Uh, I, I'm, I'm making a suggestion that we that this is a bad definition. Oh, of oh, the and, definition, and, and maybe not needs the class. To go away, maybe not, but the definition is is, is the, right. the definition, not the classification. Well, the classification could be. I've got issues with that, but I will address those later. Okay, thank you. Okay. Any other of my colleagues have a question or comment? No one else uh, has signed in to testify. Uh, is there anyone in the audience that wants to testify? No? no? Okay. Um, at this time, my colleagues, you have questions with any of the agencies? May I be excused? You want to be excused? Well, yeah, I mean, it, that's it. That's why I'm asking if they have. Huh? I, not really. No? Yeah, I don't I can go okay, since there are no questions or comments from my colleagues, um, where is it at? Uh, the next full hearing on City Council Bill 12 0152, Transform Baltimore Zoning, will be held on Saturday, September 28th at 10 a.m. at the Schaefer Engineer Building located at Morgan State University, and they will be discussing. Uh, title seven and eight, which is open space and environmental districts. <laughs> detached and semi-detached residential districts will be the topic during this evening. Uh, I want to thank all of you for attending today's Land Use and Transportation Committee hearing. Uh, please check the area around you, around your seat, to make certain that you have everything you brought with you. Uh, this concludes, uh, that doesn't conclude, it's Recess. This recesses uh, City Council Bill 12-0152. Thank you.